Wow, season finale next week. Really? This is Melissa Benoist. That's weird. Now I have to check something. Uh, let me see. Uh, Batwoman IMDb. It's one of the favorite uh, searches I do from time to time. Because I thought there were 23 episodes. Yes, there's an episode guide for 23 episodes on... Uh, so let's go down to where we are already. Yeah. If we're going to end next week, it'll be two episodes early. Well, maybe that's a good sign. I don't know. Let me go look and see what's being said here that I ignored while I was... Uh, another Superman series. Not exactly. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what's going on there. I haven't paid that much attention to it. If there is a Superman series of any kind, I'll be watching it. Uh, do I think the writers of the schlock get a bonus every time they introduce a pro SGW narrative? Uh, no, no, it's just by being written by idiot SJWs, so this is what they come up with. This is, you know, they think everything has to be some kind of statement about something. SJWE. The music sounds dreadful. Well, most of the music is some sort of pop music from past or present. I really don't know most of the time. Um, y you know, because I, 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 I haven't paid any attention to pop music since forever. Uh, but, uh, you know, to me it's like, okay, well, it, it fits as well as anything would, I guess, when it's, you know, the pop culture music. Um, doesn't jump out as me as being horrible. Um, same deal with uh, uh, with... Uh, the score music that comes out here. It never really jumps out at me as being wrong, just kind of boring, you know. Uh, go watch uh, Human Season 1 to Season 3 to desensitize yourself to this nonsense. Oh, okay, I'll take a look. Much better than Westworld, which ended badly. No surprises there. I have to take a look. Uh, humans, that's, I think I've started at least part of that at some point. I haven't watched the whole thing. Has the illegal clinic clinic of her stepsister been shut down yet? No, no, she is still run, running her uh, illegal ins unsanitary clinic that she has no license to practice medicine with. Um, uh, it, 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 it's it's what's going to happen. I'm dead certain what's going to happen is that thing is going to start making taking a back seat. Because we have been working up through most of the season for, to Batwoman getting her crew. You know, because all of these CW shows, they all do the same thing. The main character has a crew. And so this has been getting her crew. Now that she has the medical person um, who is, you know, going to be working on her medically, like now directly knowing her, her uh you know, her secret identity, she can just call her and say, I'm at the cave. Um, I got shot really badly. I think I need you to come up. And then that'll be what's happening. So we'll start to see less and less of that clinic in favor of moving over towards Mary being easily available. Uh, if I were asked to do so, how would I have written Batwoman? That is a damned good question. Um... You know, the thing about this character is she's not very an organically grown character. You know, you got Superman, you got Batman, and the people that surround them are sort of organically grown over a period of time. You know, you start out, Superman and Batman had some, you know, specific things that they could do, but it grew more over time as their mythos grew. Batwoman originally started, the reason the character got started in the first place was because it was the 50s and they were having trouble with various people saying, oh, Batwoman, Batman is homosexual, you know, uh, Robin is homosexual, uh, you know, it's, it's destroying children's minds. And so in order to get around that, I believe they told um, Bill Finger and uh, Bob Kane, you guys got to come up with a female character. Um, and, and it's got to be some kind of, you know, bat-related female character that is constantly going after Batman all the time so we can get this stuff about him being gay. We've got to make sure that he's got a case of the not-gays. So uh, that's why that character was created in the first place. 
Um, you know, over the years, she's been recreated several times to the point where there is a version of her now running around out there that is a um, uh, that is a, uh, a gay woman. Um, but again, this was not an organically grown sort of character. They looked around and they said, what you know, character that nobody ever uses anymore can we come up with to make our SJW message? And they looked around and they said, oh, Batwoman. That was a dumb kind of, and it was, kind of a dumb character to start with. Um, you know, there solely so that she could make Batman look, Batman look heterosexual. So they took her and they said, okay, well, what can we do with her? And again, it's not a very organically grown character. If it were me, I'm not even sure I'd touch it. I, I'd, I'd, I'd prefer to go to, with Batgirl. Um, I think that makes... Oops. Going with Batgirl makes a little more sense. I can find think of a lot of directions to take her. Um, I probably wouldn't have done Batwoman at all. Uh, if they'd said, we want you to do Batwoman, I would have said, why? This is a character that has never worked real well. Even right now, it, it, I, it, well, they're still producing her, but nobody's buying them that I'm aware of. So I'm not sure I would have done the character at all. If you forced me to, if you, if you said to, to me, okay, Bill, um, we're going to tie you down to a chair and require you to do this show. Well, I'd have done everything differently. I'd have done everything differently. I would have stayed away completely from any villains ever shown in the comics. That is, for me, sort of a, a general rule of thumb. If you're working on a comic book or anything else, stay away from the characters that have already been used, like the big-name ones. Just stay away from them. Come up with something on your own. I'm not sure what I would have done with Batwoman on my own, but one thing I know I would do is I would start out with some rules. Don't touch anything that happens in the comics ever. Come up with your own original bad guys. You know, make the comics catch up with you instead of the other way around, which happens. But yeah, I'm not sure what I'd done with Batwoman. I would have made it very different. Um, don't think I could have cast Ruby Rose. Um, she's not uh, physically imposing enough to, but I, I don't know. Ah, uh, let's see. Drop a two. Surely a bad girl series would have been better. At least we uh, know a lot more about her. Um, yeah. Well, again, that's bad girl did not exactly start out as a <clears throat> um, character that was organically grown out of the group. Um, the first bat girl out there was a child partner to the bat woman I just described. And part of her deal was that she was supposed to be hitting on Robin all the time. So that bad girl kind of came and went along with that bat woman. Um, they were not used very frequently and not very often for decades. And so you come back around to her today, and we had what happened with the bat girl um, in the bat Batman TV series in the 60s, where the they introduced bad girl and said, wow, the DC said, that is a damn good character. Let's introduce ourselves. Um, and did a lot more detail in terms of her backstory and all of that. Um, but with Batgirl, you start to get into the possibility, at least, of some of the Batman uh, rogues gallery, you know, that he's got because she did fight some of them. And you get into, you know, other superheroes. Again, if I'm doing it on TV, my main rule is do not do anything that's ever been done in the comics, period. Figure out a way to do it that's not, you know, that maintains, still stays with the basis of what the character is. But, but at the same time, we see... We've already seen all this other stuff before. We've seen it several times, the way that these idiots in comics work. You know, we see a story in the Silver or Golden Age. They rewrite it for the Silver Age. Rewrite it for the Bronze Age. Rewrite it for the Modern Age. Rewrite it, all the same stuff over and over. My rule is never touch it. Come up with brand new um, characters uh, as uh, bad guys for these. Make, make comics pe ca play catch up. Ah, uh, my uh, most favorite, least favorite Batman film. Um, I have a weird deal for that in terms of the way that goes. In general, my favorite Batman movie of all time is going to be uh, Tim Burton's 1989 Batman. Um, I thought that was a very good Batman movie. Um, it was, you know, just at the time that we were beginning to say, hey, we need to make him into Iron Batman. And so, you know, but even then, the, you know, the armor that he's got um, is nothing like, you know, the sort of Iron Batman look that he's gotten into lately. You know, Batman is, when best, is the, um, is, is the world's greatest detective. 
And he doesn't go around in an armored costume. He just goes around in a cloth costume of some kind. Um, in point of fact, when I'm done, I'll uh, I'll put it on, on as, a, as part of the description. Um, let me see if I can find it. There is um, a really good web series that just finally finished its sixth episode after I don't know how long. Shadow of the Bat, maybe? No, that's not it. Uh, let's see here. If I could do a Batman fan film. Because there are some really good fan films out there. Um, there's one that I think is really, really good. Um, God, I'm not finding it. Uh, there's a question one. That's another fun. Well, the one that I'm thinking about here, I'll see if I can find it. And I'll put it in my uh, I'll put it in my description after I'm done. But it is Batman set in the 1940s, um, you know, or not late 1930s. Um, really very cool. Um, live action, six episodes, about a half an hour each, done in the style of um, the uh, movie serials of that era, but a lot more serious than the movie serials of that era that's aiming more at adults. And it also uses real amazing film noir kind of techniques. Um, it, it's shot in black and white. Um, the, the, the shadows and stuff, if you know film noir, uh, it's very much a film noir movie, and that's really what Batman ought to be. Um, he does some stuff that are detective things um, and that move the plot forward, and some other stuff happens. But basically, he is the world's greatest detective, and that's what Batman should be. Um, that's, that's what I would do for a, a Batman TV series, and what I would, would like to see as my favorite. But beyond that, um, the, my favorite film in general is, is the Tim Burton one. I also have a special place in my heart for the uh, first of the 1940s uh, ones. Not because they're very good, because they're not for the most part. Um, they aren't even good uh, children's fare at the time. There's much better stuff out there you can see. But if I was going to do it, I'd like, I would like to see you know something like this guy who's done uh, the Batman uh, um, uh, um, uh, fan film. I, I'd like to see something like that where it happens in the 1930s. I think that's a really interesting uh, way to go with the, the character. Well, hell, I'm not finding it here. Uh, anyhow, I'll find it and I'll put a, a link in my description box when I'm done. Um, because it's really a very cool one. My least favorite one, I don't even remember for sure which one of the two it is. It's one of those two, you know, either Batman and Robin or something like that. One of the Bat the Robin ones, it's just terrible. It's the one with um, uh, Clayface and the Riddler, and not Clayface, but uh, Two-Face, the Riddler, um, and a couple of other people. And it's just, oh, it's terrible. I thought it was horrifyingly bad. Uh, how about a Bat Mite TV series? Well, Bat Mite, uh, that could be interesting. Uh, as long as you say, you know, this is this is just amusing. This is this is all comedy. Um, you know, this isn't uh, this isn't anything. We're not going to write anything here where, you know, these characters are going around where where Bat might goes around killing people. Um, you know, might use something where we get a, 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 a real Batman type case as a springboard, but then Batman's gone pretty quickly, um, just so we can do funny things with that character. It, it could work. It could work. Robert Zeus Batman 1940s, maybe a Will Eisner or Alex Toth aspect. Uh, no, I've forgotten what this one is. And there's another one that I will find that um, it's, it, this one is really just, you know, take Batman and put him back into his roots in like 1939 when he first showed up. Um, and that's kind of what they're doing here. Uh, they've got, oh God, I wish I could find it. Um, there's also Dark Knight Returns, by the way. A fan has put together 45 minutes worth of. Um, it's ad it's adapted from issue one from Dark Knight Returns. I'll put that one in here because I'm finding that immediately. If you look that up on YouTube, I've watched that one. That is really good. It's a really good adaptation of the Dark Knight Returns. It's very very good. Hey Shadow Man, how are you doing? You say I'm so tired of every Batman moving, having a different Batman, a different Batmobile, different suit, etc. Yeah. Um, it's one of the reasons that I have a safe spot, a, a, a soft spot in my heart for those 1940s Batman serials. Because they just had a car. You know, it wasn't anything crazy. And that's what it was first in the comics, too. It was just a, a an expensive sort of sports car. 
it was just a car. You know, it was only in the 1950s that they started to go crazy and have all of this, you know, he 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 would always get more and more stuff on his bat on the um, utility belt. But the car started out for years as just a car, but then in the fifties or so they said, no, no, we we can put a a, a small computer. Uh, we can put a small crime lab into the back of it. It'll make it an even more cool car. Um, and now, of course, we have today. Basically, they're trying to make Iron Man out of Batman all the time. Every single Batman we've had for the last number of years. You know, starting with, I guess, with the Christopher Nolan Batman, um, we started to get magic everything. You know, it's not just a guy in a suit, it's a guy in armor. I mean, it's a cloth suit or something like that. It's, it's not just a guy with a cool utility belt. He's got a cool utility belt and five million other things. Um, you know, it, it, it started to go crazy because they saw how Iron Man was doing and they said, how, how, can, we, how can we do that? We want, we want some of that. How do we do that? Well, they need to just have Batman, a guy, in a cloth suit, the greatest detective in the world. When um, Gordon can't figure something out, he shows up, does some stuff, starts doing his detective work. It's like putting a costume on Sherlock Holmes, really. Uh, Drop Truth says, was the Green Hornet derived from Batman? Um, actually, the Green Hornet has a very weird um, production history. I happened to be listening to it the other day. The Green Hornet was um, originally a, uh, a a weekly. Um, no, let me think here. How did that work out? Yeah, what it was. It was originally a Detroit television. I mean, a radio program. Um, radios used to be everything that we have on TV now. And at one point, they said, "Okay, how can we?" And what was real popular as well that they were producing at that time was Lone Ranger. So they said, okay, how can we come up with something that's a spin-off of Lone Ranger but somehow works today? Well, it turns out that the uh, secret identity of the Green Hornet, and I'm not remembering what his full name is, John Reed or something like that. Last name's Reed. But he is the great, great grand nephew of the guy that you, saw, that you heard in the radio program who was tending he was the brother, of, apparently, of uh, the Lone Ranger, and he had to deal with some tending uh, the silver um, mine from which they both made the bullets that they used so famously and also to keep their operating expenses up. If you ever wondered where, um, you know, where is he getting all of these, uh, the money to run, and where is he getting all these silver bullets, well, that's where it came from. So... I don't remember if his last name's first name's John, but his last name's Reed. Is the great great grand nephew of the Lone Ranger. So that show in, was uh, was very explicitly tied to something that happened on the radio station where it originated. There was, a, I guess, what you'd call sort of a crusading investigating reporter, and he had a big show on at the end, uh, like every Sunday or something like that. I've forgotten now. But once well, like. Once a week, once a day, he had his own show where he would talk about corruption. And as it happened in that time and in Detroit, there was a lot of corruption. And so he had lots of stuff to talk about. And then, on the way home from a broadcast, he was assassinated. He was killed by the, under, uh, the uh, gangland. It was a gangland shooting. Killed him. So what they did with, um, with Green Hornet was they said, okay, we want to make it similar to that. We're going to take, you know, because the Green Hornets, his alter ego, is the editor and a crusading reporter for a local newspaper. So they said, we're going to take that. We're going to take that event where somebody on our station was killed because of what they're doing. We're going to flip it a little bit and turn it into um, a radio program. And it spilled over eventually into the uh, comics, uh, comic strips, um, daily comics, and I believe there were some that were uh, published, but those were mostly republishing the dailies. So there's a comic over it. Um, you know, there's most famously a Batman. There's a 1960s TV series that's kind of camp that had crossovers with Batman. But no, um, the Green Hornet origin is actually a hell of a lot more interesting than you'd think. Main thing to remember is Green Hornet is, in fact, related to the uh, Lone Ranger. And that's by design. He is related to the Lone Ranger. 
Uh, let's see. Drop Truth says Chuck Barris designed the classic Batmobile. Way cool. Yeah, I I generally have liked Batmobiles, but you know my my favorite my favorite probably of all time is the 1960s Batmobile. Um, that said, probably you know right in behind it is the one from the uh, uh, 1989 Batman movie. Um, I would like to have any of those Batmobiles. That would be so cool um, to be driving around. There's a guy somewhere, I think, in, uh, in um, uh, Australia who has a street legal 1989 Batman TV, uh, Batman movie, um, Batmobile. Goes around in it and everything. Uh, I, I, you know, I'd probably like to have the 60s Batmobile for that. But the, you know, I, any, give me any Batmobile that I can drive around on the street. Um, Drop Truth says, in Japan, the Green Hornet was known as the Kato Show because of the popularity of Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee. Yeah, yeah, that was the 60s TV series, and uh, and Bruce Lee thought it was going to be his, well, not, he didn't think that was going to be his breakout, but when he got, he got Bruce Lee called up to, he was going to be doing um, Kung Fu, you know, the one starting, starring David Carradine. And if he'd done that, it would have been a huge breakout role for him. And he was a little perturbed. I remember reading someplace he was pretty perturbed that he didn't get that movie while at the same that um, uh, TV show. While at the same time, they gave it to a guy who was in no way of Asian uh, origin. Looked a little bit like it, but he wasn't. So today you couldn't even do that. You couldn't get away with it. I mean, I'm, you just couldn't do it. Uh, Shadow Man says, I want that 60s Batmobile. Yeah, well, as I say, probably my favorite of all time is that 60s Batmobile, just because of all the little gadgets that it's got here, the bat this, the bat that, and everything, and and its general look, you know, the exterior look. Um, that's a, obviously, I don't know if you, if you don't know, that the 60s Batmobile was a concept car. Um, it was one that, you know, I remember Ford or somebody made like three of um, as a concept vehicle. It showed off its shows. Um, car shows and stuff like that, but it was never intended to be purchased and driven. Um, so, so there are people now who have um, street legal 60s Batmobiles. Those are probably a little bit easier to make street legal than the 1989 one because the 1989 one has a long, weird, long chassis and all kinds of other stuff. Can't imagine that it would get uh, very good mileage. <laughs> Rob Two says Bruce Lee was uh, apoplectic about missing out on kung fu. He wasn't known for his humility. Yeah, oh, I, uh, I know that. Yeah, he he was. It, you know, there's a lot of different stories, but a lot of the stuff that he talks about uh, that he did or how strong he was or all that uh, tended to be a little bit on the self-promotional side. No, don't get me wrong. He was a great martial artist in in movies. I've seen you know Bruce Lee movies, and they're always very you know. Generally on the on the edge of your seat for most of the fights, um, so he's really very good at that. But uh, yeah, like anybody else, he was kind of self promotional. Yeah. Shadow Man says yes, I know about it. It was the F uh, Ford Futura concept vehicle. Three of them made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, it was uh, yeah. It, they they've done that a lot. There's a, there's some funny ones um, that you can see that were used for Star Trek episodes where they were supposed to have something like, like uh, bread and circuses uses a because that's supposed to be say, taking place on a, a very similar world to earth where we have these um, you know instead of coming down and, and you know sort of going down western civilization as we imagine it maybe there wasn't something like a bubonic plague and we instead we went down uh, the direction of the romans right but if you look in the backgrounds and on commercials and stuff like that within the show you will see different interesting looking cars, like a three-wheeled car and things like that. Again, all concept cars that they borrowed very briefly to, to do shoot a little film with or shoot some stills with so they could use it in the show. Um, anytime they could get something like that, they would, yes. Drop it 2 says, who's your favorite comic book, Batman Karnica artist, Neil Adams or Jim Aparo? Uh, yeah, Neil Adams for me, um, hands down, just hands down. He took uh, Batman basically at a time where he'd been sort of defined by that 1960 series and uh, turned it around so that he was once again the greatest detective on earth and uh, a guy with a costume. Um, and I, I think all of Adams' work is really good, frankly, just about all of it. Um, uh, if you if you want to get me a Neil Adams um, drawing with his uh, with a with 
his signature on it says, to my bestest friend in the world, Bill, I'll be happy. I'd be fine with that. <laughs> I did also like Jim Amparo. Um, not as not for the same thing, but uh, but um, he had a real stylized way of doing it that um, worked rather well for Batman. So I also liked him. 1995, it was a 19... I mean, look, I can't quite see if it's a five or six. 1955 Lincoln Futura. Okay. Either way, it was still a cool concept car that uh, I would love to have someday, but we'll never have the money for because I have to work for a living. So, or did. <laughs> and I'm not going to be retiring with tons and tons of cash. Oh, God, I've still got my thing on here, and I'm watching Supergirl chewing gum, I guess, is what she's doing now. I can't tell. And uh, Martian Manhunter not looking like a Martian. Ah, I'm going to turn it off. It's dumb. It's dumb. It's stupid. It's awful. It's ring. Throw that set away. Okay. Uh, Dr. Shonaman says, yup. Uh, sorry, moving a couple of things back over here so that I don't have to be constantly watching this crap. Uh, I want to take you and move you down here. And I can get rid of you and you. So many I have so many windows open when I'm doing a streaming like this because I've got I've got the uh, program that I'm using to actually do the streaming, which is OBS, Open Broadcast Software. Uh, I have a very very poor man's uh, um, uh, a teleprompter. Excuse me, teleprompter. Uh, it's not really a teleprompter. It's just an application that lets me use my mouse wheel to scroll past, and there are some things that I have there written on it. So, uh, But then I've got also, uh, I'm now down here. I usually have it up higher. But now down here I have a window that's showing stream information, and uh, sometimes it's right and sometimes it's wrong. But I always have these things up. And then I, of course, usually have that window up where I'm watching the show online. Dropazoo says, what's my opinion about the new Robert Patty Cake Batman? Um, I'm willing to give that a shot. I'm willing to wait and see. I was, uh, I was, you know, I've heard lots of things. He, I've never, I haven't really seen anything Robert Pattinson's in, aside from those movies where vampires are sparkling. But, um, I, I think about it in the same way uh, of Michael Keaton in 1989. At that time, Michael Keaton was only known for his comedic work. It was the only thing he was known for. He was pretty, you know, he'd had some fairly recent success with um, Beetlejuice. And, and, you know, that sort of comedy is what he was uh, really uh, um, known for. And so when we were told it was, he'd been cast as Batman, we were just like, oh, God, no. You know, this is going to be another comedy like it was in the 60s. That's not what really we want with our Batman in that. Well, it turned out he was great. It turned out he was really good in it. I, I, he's my favorite um, He's my favorite Batman actor. Um, he turned out he was really good in it. So as far as Robert Pattinson goes, uh, yeah, on the face of it, I go, oh, man, that sounds like a weird sort of, uh, you know, sort of uh, thing. But... They made the same sort of choice in 1989. Uh, I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt just to see what happens. I, 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 my, all of my expectations with regards to any DC uh, film with their characters in it, my expectations are somewhere lower than dinosaur bones. Um, y you, you can't do much of anything that's going to say, well, yeah, hmm, what a shock, it sucks. You know, that's what I'm expecting. At, 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 at best, you might be able to kind of, oh, wow, that turned out to be better than I thought. Uh, so if if it turns out to suck, I'm going to be like, yeah, okay, they pretty much all do. And, and if it turns out to be any good, I'll go, wow, cool, they actually did something right for once. Maybe they'll keep that up. Um, but again, when you've got expectations lower than dinosaur bones, if you can do anything positive that's going to show up on my radar, uh, what's the word worst Batman film? Uh, in my opinion, uh, I think I mentioned that M worst Batman is is the one I don't remember what, what the n which name it is, but it's one where Batman has Robin and uh, Batgirl. I think Batgirl's in it, um, and the uh, um, 
Two Face and um, Bane and uh, uh, what's his name, uh, 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 the Riddler. That one I thought was really terrible. That, I don't even remember the name. I just probably because I thought it was awful. Uh, Robert Pattinson's Shadow Man says he's just too uh, wimpy. He's a good guy, but Batman? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. That's that's what he's got the reputation for, and, and I don't know how that translates into doing something like this. Because of how surprised I was at uh, Michael Keaton, I am willing to, again, the benefit of the doubt until I actually see him, but since my expectations are lower than dinosaur bones, who cares? Um, <clears throat> do I watch the DC animated films, Justice League, uh, Dark, Op Dark Apocalypse War? I have watched some of them. Um, to be frank, uh, what I'm seeing now does not equal what uh, Bruce Timm did with the Batman, I mean, uh, but the DC animated universe. That's the best one they've done. They, had, they generally made the right decisions, the right choices on that one. And if, if they did nothing else, they could go back and just steal all of the scripts from those and do them. You know, same thing with Batman. You know, you don't have, you don't have Darkseid as your first villain. You work up to that down the line, you know. Um, it's, it, it, th that is where they have done all of their heroes the best, is in the DC animated universe. And if they were smart, they would just pick up those scripts and start making them into um, live-action films because they're almost all pretty good. So, uh, the uh, Batman Forever, a Joel Schumacher travesty. Yeah, I didn't remember whose it was. I knew it was Schumacher's, but I didn't remember which Batman. Or, and I just, you just. I just have a bad taste, and it's a blur of bad. I can name several different scenes that are just so bad, you just like, okay, forget it. I'm giving up. Uh, but it's kind of a blur of it because of that. Michael Keaton read the script of Batman Forever and refused a $15 million paycheck. Well, good for him. I'm always glad to hear when you know actors have some level of artistic integrity. You know, by then he had he had a fair amount of money because he was you know pretty popular actor and, and remained so. But but the, you know any time an actor can say, "Wow, they're going to give me fifteen million and all I have to do is this," huh? That is boy, if, if I could really use that fifteen million for practically no work. And uh, yeah, I'm sure that that went through his mind. But when you've got somebody who has enough integrity to say, ah. Uh, Boy, $15 million would be nice, but this thing really sucks, so I'm going to pass. That, that, that's yay for Keaton. <clears throat> well, let's see. It is about 8.32 my time, which is half hour or so after Batwoman was over. Watch the, uh, uh, Drop Truth says, watch the screen rant, Batman Forever, a pitch meeting. It's hilarious. Oh, I'm sure I've seen it. I'm sure I've seen it. I've watched all of those pitch meetings. I've watched them with extreme interest when they come out. I think they are hysterical. Um, I, I wish I had the, uh, the necessary uh, 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 talent in, uh, to write something like that and the ability to uh, you know, edit it because those are just so, oh, those are so much fun. Um, I, I have watched, they have one that's an edited version of all of the Marvel movies all the way up through, I think they got through, uh, I know they got through in, uh, um, the uh, uh, last Avengers movie. I think they got into the Spider-Man that came after that. But they do it all in chronological order, the movies. Not when they made them, but when the movies would have appeared chronologically. Um, they're great. It's, <laughs> they're just great. Uh, it's it's it, the one that if you really want to have some fun, uh, if you haven't seen the TV series uh, um, Tiger King. Okay, I I hadn't seen it, but I watched the Screen Junkies. Uh, you know, um, Batman Forever. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, the pitch meeting for that. There's probably several writers on the pitch. I'm sure there are. Yeah, there's more than one. That's a professionally run show. But the, uh, the 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 pitch meeting, uh, God, where was I? I? I wandered off. Oh well, I oh the pitch meeting for uh, for the uh, Tiger King, right? If you've not seen it, if you watch the pitch meeting, you just go, 
this can't be real. You know, it's too funny. It is just by nature hysterical. And if you watch the trade, the, the, the pitch meeting, you go, this can't be real. This can't be real. So I was intrigued by this. I hadn't seen the, the TV series, so I, I, I watched that, and I went, that can't be real. So I put it on, and I'm watching it, and after an episode or two, I'm like, this can't be real. This can't be an actual um you know, documentary of some kind. This is all too crazy. And then you start looking it up and you go, no, it's real. My God, this actually happened in some fashion or another. No doubt it's not 100% accurate, but still you go, I can't believe that actually happened. You know, so, <laughs> um, but the, the, uh, the pitch meaning for that is really funny because um, the subject matter is itself so bizarre. Uh, like I say, you just say to yourself, this can't possibly be real. This can't be real. There's no way that something this crazy is real. No, it's it's real, you know. <clears throat> Drop it 2 says, I watched the Tiger King and Pitch Meeting and so didn't bother with the series. Yeah, you can do that, too. You can do that, too. Just when they're talking about this crazy stuff. Yeah, it's real. It actually happened. <laughs> it actually happened, you know. You have this one guy who keeps tigers. He's not the main focus of the story, but he also has basically a harem of people, women, that he has convinced. And basically, it's, it's like a cult. You know, there's that guy. There's the woman who has tigers and may have killed her husband and fed them to one. Really? That's, that's an actual thing that may have happened in this show. Um, and then there's the guy who, if, uh, he, the, you know he's in jail right from the beginning. They start off with him being in jail. But he had his goose cooked nine different ways from Sunday, not the least of which was. He actually called a, uh, tried to get somebody, put, he tried to put out a hit on this woman I just talked about who's maybe killed her husband and fed him to the tiger. Um, he wants to put out a hit on her because he considers her his worst enemy or something. It's just, what the hell? And so, <laughs> you just remember, when you're watching that, everything they say in there is to some extent true. It's just so crazy, but it's true. Uh, Dropper 2 says, who is my favorite DC Comics character? Superman. I have been a Superman fan since way, way back. Um, basically kind of uh, uh, discovered comic books with Superman. Uh, I, if you ever want to watch it, my, I'll put a link to it after I'm done here. But my review for um, uh, the uh, uh, Superman the movie in 1978 talks about some of my very uh, personal connections with that and why I think that movie is really good and why I think the character of Superman, while he seems uh, like a goody two-shoes today, is in fact a character that could exist today given that character's backstory, and I've always said to DC, for God's sake, call me, particularly with respect to Superman. You have no idea what you're doing with this character. You're screwing it up big time, and as a consequence, sales have been dropping off for years. Call me. I will provide scripts, and we can go to town and have a character that will hit the stands again. But, of course, DC doesn't do that because they're a bunch of idiots. Uh, Drop says, enjoyed my 40th anniversary show. I do this a lot. Um, actually, I have been way behind on doing actual reviews for this show. Coming up very soon, I hope, um, is, uh, uh, is uh, um, Colossus, the Foreman Project. Um, that one's, oddly enough, timely. Um, but it's it's another one where I've got, what, a uh, 50 or 60th anniversary, 50th anniversary review, I think, on it. Um, I do that a lot with my older stuff, and sometimes it's good, and sometimes you get something. Please don't ever watch um, uh, uh, Frankenstein 1970. It was it, Frankenstein 1970. That was shot in 1958, I think, and it's a terrible movie. Don't ever watch that. I did, re I did review it, but I, I wish I hadn't now. Um, but... Uh, you know, the, the ones that uh, I do these, uh, you know, what I'm trying to do generally is get films on their anniversary of some kind. You know, so I'll go up all the way back to 1900, if there's something back there. 1910, 20, 30, 40, etc. That's this year. Next year it'll be the 21s and so forth. Um, I have a whole bunch of them that I'm behind on doing for a variety of reasons having to do with COVID. None of them bad, just time-consuming. So... Um, 
yeah, Colossus the Forbin Project is really good, and it's timely. You know, we're talking about what happens if, you know, your AI decides that it, you're, you're wrong and it's going to do things for you. Um, we're at that point now. We're starting to be at that point. What happens when the AI does something that you didn't? And it's real cute. It's interesting to watch. I've, been, I've watched it a couple of times now. I've been doing notes. Hopefully, next week, hopefully. Um, and behind that is a review that I have the date scheduled for. Um, I don't know if I'll do it, hit it on that date, but it's the uh, it'll be another 60th anniversary review for uh, Beneath Planet of the Apes. So I'll be doing that as I go along. So I've got a couple that I you know I'm I'm I literally having the works so that just for various reasons have not had a chance to sit down and write out completely and record. So I will be doing. I will be getting back to some actual reviews, uh, particularly since next week. I didn't realize it is where the uh, live streams for Batwoman are going to come to an end. I'm going to figure out some other reason to have a live stream after that. I think doing them once a week is a good idea. So, uh, did I get the link to the Starlog magazine, the fantastic Hollywood uh, muscleman, which has the David Prowse uh, routine for Christopher Reeve? I did, and thank you very much for that. Uh, always like to see this because I. I, I, I remembered there being pictures around that time, but of course, you know, so much time has passed. You want some real fun for me, if you want real fun, hunt up the um, Parade Magazine uh, piece on Bill Shatner in the mid-1980s, after he had done Star Trek II, but before he started uh, T.J. Hooker. Or maybe he was just about to do production on T.J. Hooker. Look for that one. Because it has a picture, shockingly enough, of Bill Shatner without his rug. Um, and he doesn't look bad. Um, I don't know where they got the picture. I have no idea because I've never seen it before or since. I only saw it one time as part of the Color Insert Parade Magazine, which newspapers used to get and still do, I think. But it's in Parade Magazine early to mid to, um, 1980s but as a picture of Bill Shatner without his rug and God I wish now looking back at that time I wish I had put bagged and boarded that sucker because that would be you know nobody remembers that thing but I sure as hell do anybody on that Sunday who are friends of mine in Star Trek remember that one because he had no rug um, what he had going on was not dissimilar from what I have going on. Um, you can see here that, I, in point of fact, I you know, have no hair up in the temples and kind of a widow's peak. Um, it's starting to thin out really bad. Um, but that's, that's not unlike what Shatner's hair was like in the mid-1980s. It didn't look bad. It didn't look bad. It looked normal for a man his age. Um, if he if he had gone on with that hair in movies, it would have been fine. Um, the Star Trek movies wouldn't have suffered from him showing his own hair. Um, he was just vain enough that he didn't want to do it. But if you can find that one, Parade Magazine, early to mid-1980s, Shatner without his rug. Um, big picture, full page, you know, um, magazine insert page picture. Again, wish I had grabbed it. Uh, oh, Colossus, yeah, great film. Many have known of his existence. Yeah, it's part of the reason I do some of the older reviews here. Westworld's uh, Robo Beam, um, Rojo Boom, is uh, based on Colossus. Plagiarism or homage? I don't know. Um, there's very little that's new in the world. Very, very little that's new. I don't know if you call it plagiarism necessarily. People are using ideas from other people constantly. It's, it's just how science fiction works. Um, they've been using ideas from ideas from ideas all the way back. I mean, I, I get a kick out of just going out to, you know, um, Project Gutenberg and reading Astounding Stories, number one. And, you know, that's 1929 or 30, 31, something like that. And even then, if you read the stories, you say, okay, if we take this and we update it to more present tech, the issues that they're exploring in these stories tend to be the same ones we see today. The difference is just technology involved. Um, there was one in uh, the first issue of Amazing Story, um, yeah, Amazing Stories, uh, or Astounding, sorry, Astounding. There was one in the first issue of Astounding. Why does it bump in? I don't remember what it was about, but it was something that we see science fiction tropes using all the time. 
Um, very, very little is new. If you go back in time and go start going through all of those, you go, wow, this is the same kind of story we're seeing today. It's just that we have to change the technology. You know, instead of having rocket ships and, and stories taking place on Mars, you know, we have warp drive and stories that take place on Tarsus 6. Um, but the story itself, what they're examining in that story oftentimes, is very, very similar to what we've seen for decades. Um, it's just that the people coming up with it now don't know about it, or they saw it and they went, that's a good idea for basis for a different story that I want to write. I can take that piece and you know, kind of run with it. Uh, so I don't think there's generally a lot of plagiarism um, most of the time. Sometimes you get, you know, where they're taking things and calling it homage. You know, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, Star Trek Nemesis, there are two really common movies, um, you know. Or, for that matter, uh, Star Trek Into Darkness, where... <laughs> gotta love him. Um, <laughs> where, uh, what's his name, uh, director uh, uh, Nicholas Meyer said, well, if you're going to rip off a movie, at least rip off the best one. <laughs> Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds. <laughs> 